I'm Brigadier General John Evans. I'm the uh, commander of the Army Special Operations Aviation Command. It's my uh, chief warrant officer, CW5 Mark Meyer. And my command sergeant major, uh, command sergeant major Steve Helton. So we'll go ahead and, uh, and have a seat and see if, uh, if we've got interest from the crowd to ask questions. Hello. Give you a little space. So once again, the curse of following Thomas Todd. He's got his posse, his uh, his troop. Yeah. We've been asked to pose for a picture, but go, go ahead if you have a question. Yeah. Uh, Jen Judson with Defense News. Uh, last year I had asked about this as well, and so I'm hoping for maybe a little bit mo of movement or a status update on a possible Little Bird replacement. Okay, good question. Um, you know, right now with current technology, um, we, are, we are wed to the program that's going to provide us the 3.0 block upgrade to our current mission-enhanced Little Bird, the Mel B. Uh, and we expect that to take us into uh, at least the, the FVL time frame. Uh, I don't believe we're going to see anything that is going to uh, emerge prior to FVL uh, that would replace the Little Bird. And frankly, we've got some, some decisions to make about what capability we are willing to seed if we decide to go with a Cape Set 1 type offering of FVL because, uh, frankly... Anything that we would look at for future vertical lift based on some of the conceptual designs I've seen would be larger than the current Little Bird footprint. And we, we like the, the current Little Bird footprint because we can do things with it that no other helicopter can do with regards to strat load and being able to land and do things in certain areas. The Melby Block 3.0 will provide us greater capability, greater high hot capability, and, uh, and provide more payload back to our supported ground force. Is that it for a 3.0 block upgrade? Is is just flying in high hot and more payload? Yeah, there there are a, a few more enhancements with regards to how we're looking at mission uh, or, or aircraft survivability. We think we've got uh, a bit of an envelope for expansion there that we've really not had in the past because we've been so weight conscious with the Little Bird that we've really depended on its size and uh, its ability to stay away from the threat. We know as the threat is getting more advanced uh, that we've got to kind of take a look at what we can do to provide that aircraft some active protection systems, and we're looking to that as well. Okay. And let me just see if I get this straight on, on FEL. Um, you, you're basically going to have to decide whether you forego something smaller and go with a larger aircraft that would be capability is that one or you would potentially like go it alone and buy something that does fit in that same footprint. Um, I know there are a few things out there that maybe you could, but um, that's also you're also a smaller force, so that's a small amount of aircraft. So can you talk a little bit about uh, you know how you're thinking about that? Yeah. So uh, again, what what we do, you know, we we kind of center our focus in special operations on uh, on what the ground force commander needs. Uh, so if if he needs speed, range, and payload that will keep up with a 200 plus knot aircraft like we're looking at for FVL, it'll be very challenging to stay with a platform like the current Little Bird or, a, or a, an in-kind replacement. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're making informed decisions in the future about what capability we would have to give up to replace that airframe. And like I said, uh, in almost all cases that I have seen currently, not that something couldn't evolve or emerge later, uh, but currently, that would require an airplane with a larger footprint, probably an airplane that is a little less strat deployable, uh, and an aircraft that would, uh, that would limit our ability to get in some of the places we can currently get in with Little Bird. But is it an option to be able to go it alone, not? Uh, so I am, I am a fan of helping to coach the Army to solutions that both Army aviation and special operations aviation can employ. I think there's great synergy in that, uh, and uh, to the degree that we can, we, we always try to do that. 
That doesn't mean that there aren't certain things that we have to go it alone on, but uh, our ability to fund those things is really kind of constrained because if you're familiar with, you know, the, the portion of the defense budget that SOCOM gets is, uh, is really not as significant as what, you know, Army gets for general purpose forces. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hey, sir. Uh, Mario Cafiro, IAP Worldwide Services. Thanks for your time today. Uh, at your briefing uh, earlier today, you talked about, in fact, I think you were, used the word that um, you're no longer insignificant in terms of the size of, uh, of the force. And, and therefore, I, I'm sure that um, means that you're no longer insignificant in terms of your demand on the resources that are available for Army aviation. And when I saw your chart that showed all the places you're operating from, I was really impressed or uh, uh, surprised, I guess, by the extent. So what are your greatest challenges then in operating over such uh, an increased uh, footprint? And uh, how can industry help you in that regard? Thank you. So uh, let, me, let me caveat my chart to start with. We're not operating all those places simultaneously. So really kind of over the course of a year's engagements, we will touch some of those places. Mm -hmm. um, and and we, when I said we're not insignificant with regards to our size, that's a little bit relative to the size of the Army as well. Mm -hmm. when, when we were formed 35 years ago, the active Army was over 700,000. Yeah. You know, our active Army now is about uh, 465, trying to get up to 476 by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's our principal recruiting source. We do get folks from Compo 2 and 3 but principally we, we uh, recruit from the active army. Uh, with regards to what industry can do, you know, the things that I, I kind of hit on it at the end, I think, when I talked about building and sustaining systems that we can maintain with ease in the field. Uh, we, we have been uh, uh, fortunate to be able to operate like much of Army Aviation has for the last 15 to 16 years on large forward operating bases that had big runways and, and lots of capacity that continued to grow over time. Uh, what we're finding now is we're, is it, we're in Afghanistan operating, uh, is we've got uh, less of that infrastructure available. So there's a greater burden on us for sustainment all the way around, from back shop sustainment to flight line sustainment to sustainment of the force when it's being employed. So I think the thing that I would ask of industry was kind of the challenge I presented to all of us collectively as a government industry enterprise, and that is make sure when we build things uh, that they work, and we do a good job of that, I think, but also that our soldiers can sustain them because I just don't think we're going to have the latitude in the future uh, to bring a large contracting force forward like we've done kind of in the last 15 years to help us with that maintenance. Similarly, we will not have the assets or the opportunity available or the time to push those assets and or uh, supply chain management goods back to the rear so they can be repaired and then returned to the fight. We, we've got to be more agile than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And somewhat related uh, to that then, in, in fact, General Todd talked about uh, condition-based maintenance. Um, are you seeing uh, a significant enough um, positive effect on, you know, on that program um, in terms of uh, the saved time, resources, and what it takes to maintain the aircraft in those uh, various locations? Yeah, so we, we've been exercising condition-based maintenance for a while. Yeah. Uh, now, we, we have some special resourcing and funding that the Army does not always have. Uh, we also are not at the same scale the Army is. So one of the big challenges, I think, for Major General Gabriel is he's got to take a look and examine how we do things at scale. Mm -hmm. But I believe that... Uh, uh, like I said, I believe our industry partners build good product. So as we work with our engineers to decide what's good enough on the time between overhaul on a, on a certain component, can we extend that? Can we assume a little bit of risk based on all of the information and data we've collected and provide more time on wing for the components so that our pilots and crew members have got the aircraft? You know, as we move further and further into the digital age and we've got health monitoring systems and data collection systems on the aircraft, we have this incredible capability to kind of look at what our trend analysis is going to be and make some very good informed decisions that will save us money in the long term. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir.
Sergeant Major, do you have anything you'd like to add? I'm, I'm just ready. I'm ready if you have any questions. You said exactly right. Hi, I'm Megan Doherty Myers from Avocent. In case no one asked the question, sir, previously in your presentation you mentioned that um, Special Operations Aviation was going to be sort of taking lead in regards to DVE mitigation solutions. Could you just add some depth to those comments? Yes, yeah, so as we are working with the Army uh, program boards, uh, we're trying, because again, we, we tend to continue to fly in environments that the Army may or may not be flying in. We can take systems out and experiment with and try those systems to see if they're going to bear fruit for us. We, we are still doing every night assault landings in unimproved areas with our aircraft. It's part of what we do. So our ability to mitigate risk to our machines and to our force uh, are, are really enhanced by some of the things that are coming down the pipe with regards to um, uh, degraded visual environment. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time over the last 15 years tearing up airplanes, just landing them. Uh, now, some of that's a function of the fact that we, we, were, we were landing in some pretty hot areas, so there was a, a great deal of urgency to what we were doing, uh, and uh, so when that happens, you've got to land the aircraft. And then some of that was a function of the fact that we had to go to areas that, that we had to adjust uh, on the fly, on the mission, to areas that we may not have had an opportunity to adequately recon with imagery or something like that. So you get there, and suddenly your landing zone is a surprise to you. We, we want to remove that, that element of doubt. We want to remove that element of surprise out of the process so that when one of our air crews goes to a landing site, uh, they can confidently move through whatever the obscurance are in that landing site uh, and, and put the airplane where it needs to be. With regards to what we're doing with industry right now, I think we're, we're moving forward. Uh, we think uh, a, a, a basically a two-sensor solution right now is going to give us good situational awareness. Uh, in the cockpit to help us with that task with an eventual aspiration to go to a full piloted system that will enable us to not only be able to be more confident in the objective area, but also to be able to transition from takeoff through the in route portion to the objective and back again in, in the worst conditions. Yeah, hi, uh, James Drew from Aviation Week. Um, I just want to uh, get a sense from SOCOM uh, how it's approaching future vertical lift. Um, you're involved in the analysis of alternatives, and um, I've heard that uh, a replacement for the uh, direct action penetrator is uh, one of the capabilities that you're looking to get out of that. Um, could you um, maybe expand on what you want to replace with your capability set three? Is it also the M, uh, the M model uh, MH60 Blackhawk that you have as well? Um, and then also, if the Army were to proceed with a capability set one, um, which they're looking at their tentative requirements for that, uh, where would SOCOM fit in there? I, I know it may not be a little bird replacement, but there is there something else that you could do with a capability set one? Okay, that's a big question. I'll try to tag all of it. Um, I'll start by saying we, we have not always been the best uh, uh, in practice uh, in our SOAC and in Special Operations Aviation in walking with the Army on the evolution of some of their platforms and capabilities. We're, we're trying to make sure we do a better job of that across the board. I think FVL is an, is an example of a place where we are doing that. We've made an investment at the SOCOM level. We are very tightly uh, uh, aligned with the Army and the other services for what the Cape Set 3 offering should look like. We have been very vocal about what our requirements are, and those requirements have been included in the AOA. So I'm very comfortable with where we're at with regards to the direction that FVL is moving and our ability to have some advocacy in that process. With regards to replacement of, of airframes, I think we're, we're taking a very broad look across Army Aviation, and that would include the RSOAC, on what it would mean to field a Cape Set 3 aircraft with regards to how we are currently structured, which platforms it would replace, which platforms it would enhance, uh, and, uh, and, and we're going to keep all of our options open. I, I think it is a little um, probably misinformed to think that for some reason 
a Cape Set 3 airplane would be a one-for-one -one replacement for every Apache and Blackhawk we have in the force. I'm not sure that's what the eventual solution will look like. And I'm not sure the force structure that we have right now with companies and battalions, you know, at the brigade level, and then uh, really no aviation above the division level is what we're looking at in the future either. I think everything's kind of on the table as we take a look at what the right force structure is going to be to support the capability gaps that exist. It really becomes about capability. Uh, we, we try very hard in our business when somebody says, hey, I need two Blackhawks to go do this mission, to say, hey, what is your mission, and I'll tell you what you need to do it, you know, because that's kind of my job. Um, and, and the same thing, I think, applies to FVL as we take a look at that family of vehicles. What are we going to need to achieve uh, uh, overmatch in these places where we have capability gaps right now? Uh, with regards to, you know, a Cape Set 1 capability, again, I think as we take a look at a fleet replacement for our mid-sized aircraft, you know, Blackhawks, Apaches, those types of airplanes, and we put them in basically a new... Uh, um, a new uh, set, uh, separate capability set with regards to speed. It's very hard to have an airplane that can't keep up with that, whether that's going to be our heaviest flying aircraft or our smallest aircraft. So we've got to take a look at what the requirement's going to be in order to be able to do the missions that are required. Yeah, so I, I know that, uh, you know, since, since we don't own V-22s at the RSOAC, uh, SOCOM does have some, uh, you know, they're always looking for capability to complement that. Uh, I can't speak for the Marine Corps, but my understanding and belief is the Marine Corps is very concerned with having a partner aircraft uh, for V-22, something that can keep up, something that can allow them to do their, uh, their uh, beyond the horizon reach. Uh, so uh, with regards to, you know, the DAP you mentioned, I think we're looking at making sure that if we have a, a utility lift aircraft that's going to be delivering personnel to a target, that we can adequately support that internally with fire support. Um, I'm hoping you can tease out the DV um, stuff a little bit more on, on what you're working on and in terms of like the timing and, and you know you said you wanted to start with a two sensor solution um, you know what does that do versus you know having this full-on like, situational awareness from the moment you take off to the moment you land um, you know what are you what are you not getting with, with the two sensor solution uh, so I would I would explain it this way and I don't want to talk about specific timing because I, I don't think that that would be well informed because we're still looking at some of that and there's still you know people competing to to provide capability. But uh, what what we've kind of made a conscious decision to do, I think, in in keeping with the chief of staff of the Army's focus principally on readiness, is to provide capability to the field sooner, as opposed to waiting for that golden bullet, that silver bullet, uh, that, that's going to be down the road from us because we're. We are flying right now uh, in, in conditions where we need the capability and the, and the assurance that that capability can offer us. And Army Aviation is too. And Army Aviation is you know, one bad political decision by somebody in the world away from being in the same boat doing the same thing. So the sooner we can bring that capability to bear, a, a capability that is, that, that is capable, that's functional, uh, that we can place on the aircraft and integrate and, uh, and, and ensure has the airworthiness that's required to be able to provide situational awareness, I think we would prefer that to waiting to flight qualify an entire system that's going to give us a pilotage solution. Uh, number one, I'm not sure our technology's there quite yet. Number two, I think that the cost factors are pretty significant with that. I'm not sure we've got a funding strategy to go to quite to that level. Uh, and then I think number three, uh, we, we've got to take a look at what the timing you know, how much time that's going to take to, to develop. So we want to get some capability out the door to start with, to buy down risk for the commanders. Uh, and then we're going, to, we're going to mature that capability. We're going to test it. We're going to uh, use it uh, in, uh, on our fleet. And then we're going to provide feedback so that we can help our industry partners make that capability better for the future.
And, and you said that the, there are people competing right now, so this is an official competition that's going on? Yeah, I, I, I am not sure where I'm at on that with regards to how we're doing things. I can tell you that we have great, we have great interest with industry uh, on, on finding a solution for this. So, so industry is coming with solutions that you're looking at right now, and then there'll be maybe it, selections on solutions. Industry's coming to me with solutions for problems I don't even have. Yeah, so. <laughs> sure, sure. But uh, when you say competing, I just I'm trying to get a sense of whether you're actually in a competition where you'll make a selection. No, no, not okay. not at that level. No, with regards to the acquisition timeline, I'm a, I'm not an acquisition guy. I'm a layman. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a line guy. So when I say competing, I'm I'm talking about best ideas being brought to the table so that we can kind of look across to see what's out there. Okay, thank you for clearing that up. Sir, Megan Doherty Myers with Avocent. Um, you mentioned again in your presentation that um, Special Operation Aviation was going to be getting back into the EW spectrum. Could you add some color to that or give us some more detail on the initiatives? Yeah, so uh, it, it probably a little misguided to say getting back into. I don't know that we ever exited, uh, but certainly like most of Army aviation, uh, we, we did not have prevalent threats in the EW spectrum and the RF spectrum uh, and, and only minor threats in the IR spectrum that required our attention over the last 15 years. So we developed some capability uh, and we used that capability but we, we didn't really push ourselves. And I think now as we take a look at the threats that face us from our, from our real, you know, the four serious threats out there, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, uh, they, they bring great capability to bear across the spectrum, across that uh, electronic warfare spectrum. So we've got to make sure that we can answer that. And again, we are working with and asking industry to come to us with best ideas on how we can mitigate some of that threat. And we're asking people to think about the problem set a little differently. So perhaps the answer to be able to do penetration into an, uh, uh, an A2, AD environment is not to hang 300 pounds of stuff on my airplane. Maybe it's you push an unmanned aerial system out in front of my airplane that spoofs, jams, does something to affect that RF spectrum and allows me to penetrate behind it. And there we I'm not taking things away from the supported ground force. It gives me better uh, survivability, uh, and it also gives me better awareness of what the threats might be out there. So we're, you know, so we're asking people to take a look at all of these things uh, and come to us with best ideas. Uh, James Drew from Aviation Week again. Um, on the Little Bird replacement, um, there's been some pro proposals uh, uh, from different companies about giving you more Little Birds, basically, and uh, doing some remanufacturing of some of the younger of your existing fleet. Um, how are you going to extend the life of that fleet up until the point there is something else that can come in there? Uh, and since that, that aircraft model is still in production, um, is there a chance to uh, buy new as you refurbish uh, to extend the life of that fleet? Yeah, so I, I won't get into specifics of the programmatics on it, but what I will tell you is we are working with the OEM to ensure that the Little Bird fleet will be able to last us through the lifetime that we need it to last us until we get to whatever the next solution is going to be. Uh, the Block 3.0 upgrade is a big part of that. Uh, it's going to allow us to reduce our unscheduled maintenance time, and that's going to be pretty critical for our Little Bird fleet. Well, no operational questions. Usually I get the questions where I say I can't answer that. No. None of that today. That's good. Yeah, so the question was, can I talk a little bit about Block 2 Chinook? Um, you know, we, again, I think an example of where we are, we are working out and moving side by side with Army Aviation, whereas we, we have not been as good about doing that in the past as we probably should have been. Uh, I think Army Aviation is getting a good... Um, 
is getting the benefit of seeing some of the advantages of how we've uh, designed our aircraft in the past. The ones, you know, our, our Echo model and, and G model airplanes specifically with regards to the tank design, where we place the landing gear, uh, the loads that those airplanes can, can carry. You're know, already one of the most capable aircraft in the Army fleets, the F model Chinook, and now we're going to give it 4,000 pounds of additional cargo capability. That, that is not insignificant. Uh, and, uh, and we are right there with them from an engineering standpoint to make sure that the ideas, the hard lessons we've learned are being shared with the uh, big army. We also, because we have the oldest Chinooks in the fleet, are in a position to be able to field those airplanes sooner and uh, uh, in the earlier lots. That's going to help army aviation, frankly, uh, and that'll give us an opportunity to, to shake out those aircraft a little bit before we get ready to field the larger uh, aviation force. Quick question on that, sir. Uh, do you have a timeline uh, for the integration of those uh, Block 2s? Uh, uh, yeah, so we need a budget. Uh, that, that would be helpful because uh, we can't do anything until we get that, and hopefully we'll have it by the end of next week. Um, I'm not specific on the timeline. Scott, if you want to stand up, if you can talk to the timeline uh, a little bit. Yes, sir. Uh, in, in an earlier forum, a question was asked about continuing resolution and the impacts to PEO Aviation, and, and specifically Block 2. It doesn't impact them as much as it does for us for the 47Gs with us leading the fleet. So once that's lifted, we're anticipating a award of the production NRE contract in the May-June time frame. And then we'll ev be evaluating the Lot 1 proposal for the production uh, sometime this summer, begin that evaluation. So that's the general timeline. Thank you. Yeah, and Scott's the director of our Aviation Proponency Office at uh, Fort Eustace. So my, my program guy, he's, he's the one that's giving me the eye. You guys asked me the acquisition questions to make sure I don't mess up the answer. I, I, you know, Block 2 is critical for us, uh, more so than the Army. You know, the Army has got a relatively new Chinook, but I think it, for those of you who may have seen my presentation, the Chinooks that I own, literally some of them are tail numbers from 1965 and 1966. Airplanes with 10, 11, 12,000 hours of metal fatigue uh, that, just, that you just can't take out of the airplane by stripping the skin. So uh, we, we are seeing the manifestations of, of that age and, frankly, the amount of uh, stress we put on our fleet because we do fly it at a heavier weight uh, and we do fly it in some pretty challenging conditions. Uh, and uh, and we've, we've worn those airplanes out. They've served us well. I mean, it was the workhorse of Afghanistan. You know, we coupled it with radar and were able to penetrate into a country that nobody ever thought we'd be able to get into. And we put special forces teams on the ground in northern Afghanistan. Uh, nobody else could do that. So. I love the Chinook. I'm a Chinook guy. I got a, uh, I got a great respect for uh, our crew members and pilots that operate them, but, but ours are old, and we need new ones because the youngsters that are, that are fixing them are finding themselves doing more and more unscheduled maintenance every day, every week, because of the age of our fleet. So the sooner we get blocked to, the better off we're going to be. So we're waiting for a budget, and once we get that, the 47G, we're going to award that in the, in the May-June time frame, you know, assuming that the budget's passed. That's the production NRE that would go into the MH-47G Block 2. There's some soft specific aspects to the Block 2, but there's also some there's an ex extensive amount of commonality that we have with the CH-47F. Um, so the production NRE contract that will help both us and the conventional side, PEO Aviation, Colonel Barry, uh, that'll go once the, the budget's lifted and we get into contract negotiations, what that timeline takes. But, you know, looking at, uh, you know, probably in the June time frame once that's uh, all complete. Then the Lot 1 proposal for production, we'll, we anticipate receiving that this summer and we'll begin taking a look at evaluating that proposal this summer. Thanks, Scott.
I will talk uh, to buy you some time for another question. I'll talk for just a minute about uh, about a capability that that we uh, that we really kind of helped bring into the Army Aviation Inventory that has been uh, a wonderful surprise to us with regards to how effective it's been, and that's our MQ-1 Charlie unmanned aerial systems, our, our uh, Group 4 UAS Gray Eagles. Um, we have seen uh, an incredible uh, amount of growth in, in that uh, in the demand signal for that capability. Um, I can't get into exactly what the Army's bigger plan is for that, but we we have one of the companies that actually resides above the division level, which means that we support uh, not just soft customers, but any customer who's on the global force uh, uh, management allocation process. So uh, when our guys are downrange, they will respond to whatever demand is placed on, on those air vehicles. We're a little bit unique from the Army in the way we employ them because we do use them for persistent ISR. And frankly, we've been very, very kinetic with them in the current fight. So uh, as I like to tell people, the most lethal company in the Army is Echo Company, second of the 160th. And they may very well be the most lethal company size element in all of the Department of Defense. Uh, and that's, uh, that's attributable to the young men and women that are out there operating that platform and, and the unique uh, agility of that platform. We are, a decision was made at the Army level to bring uh, a, a another UAS company to the RSOAC. Uh, this one would have gone to uh, INSCOM, but they've decided that it might be best to field it with us, frankly, because we can generate combat power with it a little bit faster than INSCOM can, uh, and, and it will still be GIF mappable. It will still be out there for the global force to be able to use, uh, and we look uh, forward to bringing that capability on in the next couple of years. Uh, but uh, really great capability, and we're very proud of what, uh, what those folks are doing in addition to kind of our bread and butter mission with assault and attack helicopters that we've been doing for years. Okay, I'll take silence as consent that you guys are done with me. Um, I, I appreciate your questions today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, uh, like I said in the presentation, um, we, we are part of Army Aviation. And we are dependent on Army Aviation. We believe we bring great value to Army Aviation. Uh, and uh, we will continue to do everything we can to promote Army Aviation. And uh, you can be exceptionally proud of all the young men and women that are out there, soldiers and civilians working within our enterprise and what they're doing every day and every night. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really a pleasure and a privilege for myself, Sergeant Major and Mr. Meyer, to be able to, to lead them and, and work with them in our organization. So I appreciate your time today. Thanks.